You're up. I just want to be clear. You're upset because we made friends with your cat. You're sir. unreasonable people. You're holding our cat. Go in your yard and say, Mercury, go home. Don't come in our yard anymore. She they will want not listen. To... She's a cat. She doesn't speak English. It's a cat, dude. Really? Okay. All right. Well, we'll have the police department figure it out. Absolutely. Okay. Great idea. Right. Cat pervert. Oh my God, you got I have cat done. Pervert. I've done nothing cat to bring pervert. the cat. Literally I've done nothing to pervert. bring the. I'm on the cat owner's side. I don't know. <laughs> this, guy, this guy's tempting his cat over. I don't like it. I think it's terrible. <laughs> oh man, what a what a what a what a little um uh like for me getting Anthony Stein and Matt Gaspers on. So Anthony Stein, you you came on the trivia show with us a while back when we did mm. trivia. That's how long it's been since you've been on. But that was our first video to hit a thousand views. That's huh. Like we would, we were doing the trivia show, and every show would get like six hundred views, four hundred views, and then you came on, and we got over a thousand views. So like it was, that was kind of like a milestone for us. I remember getting really excited. We had our first video hit a thousand views, and well, Matt Gaspers that, came. Now, I was gonna say now that you've got a real guest on this time with Matt, <laughs> you'll get more than that. <laughs> well, I, I figured go. Uh, so we did last year's twenty twenty two year in review. It was Matt Gasper and uh, Matt Gaspers and Kennedy. And we did it on January 4th. So it was a couple of days after Benedict XVI passed. And mm -hmm. we made a whole bunch of predictions about what we thought the year was going to bring. And I should have went back and listened to that because I would like to see if any of our predictions came true. But I, I wasn't thinking today. That would have been a good idea. Um, mm -hmm. Real quick, how, uh, Ant, how did you decide to even jump into this sector, like just started doing your videos? Uh, I lost a job and needed something to do while I was filling out five job applications a day. And I noticed that this sector of YouTube didn't exist. Who was doing it at that back in 2018 when I started? Yeah, the remnant had been around for a while on YouTube. Yeah. Like, well, frankly, they helped radicalize me, I guess you could say. Yeah. And <laughs> then you had a, a church militant. And then, even though they're not really, it's not the same thing, but they were there. And aside from that, you had uh, essentially old videos of John Venari and Father Nicholas Gruner and a few others. That's how it happened. I was like, well, this will give me something to do while I apply for jobs. I remember like the first few times seeing the return to tradition videos coming out. You just, you you weren't even your face wasn't even on camera yet. You were really you had the uh, silhouette. I was, yeah, I was ripping off of the style of the old Gamergate videos style from like 2015 because it worked. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was like interesting, like just starting to see those because it was there was a real hunger for that kind of content back then. And Matt, you started, you started working for Catholic family news when the summer of 2017, because John Venari, as uh, Anthony just mentioned, he passed away April 4th, uh, 2017. And I think that I got the date, right? I know it was April. You, you and, got the date, right? Because I remember where I was when I heard about that. I was, I was, yeah, I was. I was listening to Catholic radio or something. Yeah, it was April 4th. And I think April 4th was also the day that um, Francisco Marto died also. I forget the exact year, but John had a special devotion to Francisco Marto, one of the three Fatima seers. So very providential there. But John asked me, I was working at a parish at the time doing religious education. And um, John and I had developed a rapport over the course of several years. I had written a few articles for CFN but we'd only actually spent time together uh, twice in person because he lived in New York and I was in Colorado, but he wanted to talk to me. I think it was Jan uh, no December 23rd of 2016. He wanted to talk to me over the phone and it was explaining that he, he had been diagnosed with cancer a few months before it was a very aggressive form of colon cancer. And I think it was only about nine months from his diagnosis to his death, maybe even less than that. Yeah, he went very fast. So he just wanted to talk to me about, um, you know, the people at CFN were asking him who he might have in mind to continue on the work of the uh, of the newspaper. And he 
he mentioned me and he wanted to talk to me about that. I was completely floored. I had no idea. That's amazing, <laughs> right? Because he was like a hero of mine. So I had I was completely shocked. Um, but I now were you at were you at a traditional parish or were you just like a regular Nova Zordo guy back then? I was ba- I mean, I was trying to do as much a traditional content as I could, but it was at a diocesan parish. Yeah. Where I was working. Yeah. And what about you? When did you when did you discover the traditional mass? Um that would have been around uh well it, we started going traditional mass full time in 2017. But it was we'd gone to some traditional masses before that. But where I live in Oklahoma, it's hard to get to one without yeah. a long drive. And before I moved to Oklahoma, you know, people hear Archdiocese of Portland and they go, Archbishop Sample have to be a lot of Latin masses there. Not so much. You have the Dominican Rite traditional mass that's sometimes available there. You have an FS, you have an FSSP map, parish that is pretty much in the industrial waste part of town. Yeah. And then an SSPX chapel that's hidden away. And then the parish we got married at, which was uh, <clears throat> the one diocesan traditional parish that I could think of in the city. And it had, weirdly, you know how traditional parishes skew heavily towards younger people? Yeah. Not this parish. This parish skews heavily towards the older. And Wow. Their traditional their, their traditional mass offerings were very lightly attended. <coughs> Pardon me. No, you're good. Um, it's funny because I, I think all of us really started getting like I, I really think Francis radicalized all of us. Like I, you have to really think about the fruits of Francis because I was very much a uh, reform of the reform, uh, uh, hermeneutic of continuity guy. I was like a lighthouse Catholic media guy, all of that until I would say the summer of shame, which I think was 2018, right? Yeah, that was 2018. That was the year yep. I started. And I remember the Vigano letter was dated August 25th, right? So that's yeah. a feast of uh, our lady queen of heaven, I think. And I remember the day that letter hit, I had 373 subscribers and I looked, I went around looking around on seeing if anybody put the damn thing up on, pardon the language, but the thing up on YouTube, nobody had. So I put it up, went about my day, came up the next morning and I had almost a thousand subscribers. Like that's wild. Yeah. Yeah, So no, I remember that well, because I remember doing videos about Cardinal, you know, Cardinal Whirl. When's the last time we talked about him or, you know, uh, I remember a hilarious graphic on one Peter five when when Steve Skojek was still running it of, uh, it was where's Whirl instead of where's Waldo. Yeah. yeah. Did you guys ever see that? <laughs> yeah. And I remember reporting on the, I was shocked, shocked that my roommate of many years, All who I share a living guys. space with. Oh, <laughs> yeah. All those guys. Name? Nobody knew oh. anything. Right. You had, you had, nobody knew anything. You had, so you had Supich talking about, like, we're not going to go down this rabbit hole. Yeah, like that story comes out. You had, uh, was it De- not? I don't think it was. De- was it Daniels or no? Not Daniels. This is why I'm still shocked that anybody is defending the new document from the dicastery for the destruction of the faith, which is what we should all call it now. By the way, yeah, <laughs> because anybody defending that has a very short memory. Yeah, they have forgotten mm-hmm. Morse Laetitia. They have forgotten the uh, w- w- the response to Vigano from the Vatican, which was essentially to blame John Paul II and Vigano. For the clerical sex abuse crisis in North America. Yeah, yeah. Well, we were talking. We we were talking in the green room about just how, for the past decade, you've had Francis in, and you really didn't hear anything from the DDF or the what you know maybe it was the CDF for the early years of Francis. You didn't hear anything from them. The, like we heard in 2021, you got the we can't bet plus sin. We got that, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. really didn't hear anything until we got Fernandez, and now that Fernandez is in, it seems like every single day you're getting something new from this to, to, like Asbury. right that's why that's why i said i people need should not underestimate him at all right and he is the ghost writer of amoris letizia that's another major yeah, important is. Thing it's, to it's, understand. Uh, it's something to be bear in mind with him why do you think francis took so long to bring him up bring him up to do to, to this role i'm not sure i don't i honestly don't know much about uh fernanda's I, I haven't studied a lot of his personal history. I know that they're from the same. Uh, I mean, he's from Argentina as well, if I recall correctly. So Francis might have had some history with him. I don't know. I don't know why he took so long. Somebody in your live chat asked me what my uh, 
PhD and dissertation we're in. So my PhD is in public affairs and policy, which is sort of like the, so it's public, which is a, it's basically a hybrid of political science and public administration and public administration is itself just the child of political science. It's for, you know, public administration is a field of study for people who were like, I think bureaucracy sounds like something I want to spend my time studying. If you can imagine how dreadful that is. <laughs> what, and, what made you do that? <laughs> um, well, I ended up in my studies though, I decided I wanted to study sustainable development, all the green political stuff, which is why I recognized immediately what Laudato C was and yeah. what, what uh, the pan Amazon synod was, but I wrote my dissertation on Catholic social teaching and its approach to the, uh, to, to environmental stuff. The problem was though, like I stopped writing my dissertation halfway through and I started having to talk to priests I knew at the time saying, look, I've noticed something here that I can't escape. And that's Catholic social teaching had a logic, logical coherence until about 1962 or so. And then right afterwards, it completely goes off the deep end. Yeah. And I even put in my dissertation a, uh, in the first draft, a chapter on there being a disjunction. There was some sort of break there. And, and I even mentioned modernism there. And my chair of my committee, the only real Catholic in my political science program, he said, he wrote in the notes, uh, the church doesn't condemn modernism anymore. <laughs> and I was like, and I, the, and the only reason I even finished my, PA, my dissertation and got my PhD was because every decent priest I knew told me, just finish the thing and do good work for the church. Yeah. Just give them, give them the document they want. That's why I don't endorse my own document. If I ever start writing books, I'll probably spend time, you know, just shredding my own dissertation, at least the parts I don't agree with. Well, well you have to think how many priests are in seminary with the same mentality, right? Like just deal with this, deal with this nonsense, get through mm -hmm. seminary, f figure this out. And then once you actually get ordained, then you can have your own parish. And I think that a lot of guys did that and you're starting to see them weed those guys out now. Mm -hmm. And these are the guys are, uh, these are the father gave Nixes, And these mm -hmm. are the, these are the guys who are basically being put out the pasture now. So, all right. So we, we, we did our, our last year's year in review and it was, biggest story of the year hit the day two two days before it was pope benedict passing so that happened on new year's eve of 2022 so we've gone into 2023 and i i figured both of you like if you both had like three of the biggest stories which i think this latest same-sex blessings thing is definitely up there should be mm -hmm. in the top three i would think right? oh for sure i do we lump that in with the the um transgenders and the gay adoption thing is okay too that happened a month before that so crazy it's, i guess so right i guess i guess we should we should just call this the rainbow issues right like the mm. rainbow <laughs> issues will make one story that's the it's the outreach catholic agenda you know, yeah. you know what outreach catholic is no oh okay so james martin decided that uh having a you know working with new ways ministry wasn't enough he decided to start his own clone of new ways ministry called outreach Oh, outreach. Yeah, okay, outreach. Okay. Yeah, outreach is the sort of the is sort of like if you ever see those old spy versus spy comics of the the spy who's all done in black and the spy who's all done in white. Yeah. Well, courage is the one done in white, the good guy, and outreach is the one done in black, the bad guy. They're the basically yeah. the, the polar opposite. That's what they do. It's their program, basically. Yeah. That's what we're seeing right now. So, all right, so Matt, what would you say the three biggest stories of twenty three were? Yeah, I've been trying. I've been thinking about that. Certainly, the 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 new declaration from the DDF, uh, what is it, fiducia supplicans? Yeah. We can talk more about that. But um, towards the beginning of the year, twenty twenty, this year, twenty twenty three, uh, February, a significant story broke with the the rescriptum regarding traditionis custodis and basically eliminating the ability for bishops to invoke a particular canon in canon law to dispense their dioceses from certain elements of traditionis custodis. So a lot of uh, bishop, well, I don't know about a lot, at least a handful, I forget how many, probably half a dozen at least um, throughout the country, maybe more, would invoke canon 87 section one uh, to dispense from traditionis custodis. I'll just read that canon so we get the gist of it. A diocesan bishop, whenever he judges that it contributes to the spiritual good, to this to their spiritual good, is able to dispense the faithful from universal and particular disciplinary laws issued for his territory or his subjects by the supreme authority of the church, in other words, from Rome. It also says he is not able to dispense, however, from procedural or penal laws 
nor from those whose dispensation is especially reserved to the apostolic see or some other authority. So this rescript that came out in February says uh, the Holy Father, uh, February 20th, and this was through the, the Dicastery for Divine Worship, has confirmed the following regarding the implementation of Traditionis Custodis. And it says basically these dispensations are reserved in a special way to the Apostolic See, and it specifically cites Canon 87. So the two things it mentions are the use of a parish church or the erection of a personal parish for the celebration of the Eucharist using the old mass. That is specifically reserved the apostolic see. You have to get special permission from Rome to do that. And the other thing was the granting of permission to priests ordained after Traditionis Custodis to celebrate the old mass. So those two things, every diocesan bishop throughout the world now has to write to Rome and specifically ask for permission uh, to do those things. Now, does that also go for like... Uh... Uh, fraternity priests well, that's the big that's one question that i have because um you know my situation here i'm in the archdiocese of denver and i go to a diocesan traditional latin mass and my understanding from our local pastor is that um rome has granted the archdiocese of denver in our situation um permission until sometime in 2025 mm -hmm. and then we have to like revisit it or something like that but you know unless we have a new pope by then God willing, it's probably going to be um, shut down. I would assume at that. Yeah, point. I think that I think they did give like the two year permission to. It's like, all right, yeah, we'll give you two years, yeah. and then we're gonna we're gonna revisit this in two years. And I think that they're hoping they could just bring the hammer down. But the question the question you ask about the FSSP, or it would also apply to the Institute of Christ the King, any kind of those former Ecclesia Day Institute groups. I mean, the document says that it's specifically reserved to the apostolic see, not only the use of a parish, meaning a diocesan church, or the erection of a personal parish. And I would assume, I mean, in canon law, it seems pretty clear that a personal parish would include the fraternity of St. Peter, yeah. the Institute of Christ the King, because it's, you know, it's a parish that's devoted to a particular uh, cultural group or particular liturgical rite. So I think it that certainly applies to those traditional groups. What I what I need to find out, I don't know if there have been um, fraternity or institute parishes erected since Traditionis Custodis came out. That would be interesting to know. Well, the irony about Canon 87 is that for all the talk of pastor, like being pastoral, like that's what Canon 87 is actually for, for priests or bishops who, like for a bishop to say, well, we have a special pastoral need here, so we're going to ignore this dictum from Rome because, you know, we have to look out for this particular parish who has a devotion to this thing and we don't want to disrupt them for the sake of souls. And they're saying, right. no, you don't get to use that there. So, right. All right. So that's February. Um, what, what so, What's the next big one? And I think another major story related to the, the TLM that also came out in February, as I'm sure you guys remember, is the FBI um, memo right. that was leaked, the Richmond field office memo that was leaked by Kyle Serafin. I'm looking at the uh, LifeSite News published an article about it on February 8th. My friend Stephen Cox reported on that. Um, a document released by an FBI whistleblower indicates the agency plans to intensify its, quote, assessment and mitigation of radical traditionalist Catholics. That was the phrase found in the, uh, the leaked memo from the Richmond field office. Did, did that story shock any of you? No. I think, Stein, you're still muted, I think. No, it didn't su surprise me. <laughs> I, I'll tell you why it really doesn't surprise me, because um, first of all, I, I think the FBI and CIA watch every single thing going on. But like the, the idea of what what they're really looking for are points of unity, right? So if people are congregating around a thing that actually does have an ideology behind it, I, I, I was actually surprised it wasn't going on for longer than we found out. I mean, we know that the CIA tried to infiltrate the council and get different things put into different documents there. Like, I really think that they're very conscious of what is going on in the Catholic Church at all times. I don't think mm -hmm. they tried to get infiltrate the council. I think they did. Yeah, they did. There's um some... Italian traditionalist outlets who've done some research over the years about 
the uh, meddling of the U.S. government in church affairs going back to the 1950s. Some of it yeah. just overt threats against the Holy See. I mean, they probably have been monitoring us for a lot longer than we think. So do you think they'll have... I mean, they're obviously going to try and influence the next conclave, right? Well, I anybody who thinks that there's not a plan to ensure that there's a Francis II or somebody like him or a Paul VII after this coming conclave, anybody doesn't think that's that's already in the works. They they they're. I'd like to know what you know what their doctor has prescribed them to. Yeah, they're just very naive because I can't I can't get on board with that. Yeah, they're very naive. I, I mean, you could you could you have to consider there is going to be Francis fatigue. I think a lot of people are a little tired of this. Stuff. Right, but all it would take to to cure people of their Francis fatigue would be to give them somebody just like Francis, but someone who's uh, we'll say has a high, high, higher verbal IQ than he does. Who actually knows how to filter things just where he doesn't give a christmas homily and start talking about rigidity at yeah. christmas time you know <laughs> we did a couple nights ago it's all it would take oh the the new holy father francis ii isn't insulting us we're so good everything is fine just ignore his now you know i don't know uh, uh ms13 enculturated rite of mass for you know the occupied parts of mexico i mean that's the kind of stuff we'll probably be seeing I mean, it's looking like it's probably Fernandez. <laughs> I mean, this, this guy's a wordsmith. Yeah, but Matt, you got all right. So look, if Francis look, got I'm... all of us, if Francis gets all of us to tradition, what does a Fernandez do? Like, think about it. What do you think of a, a Pope? You know, if a, a Pope Francis II with Fernandez as that guy, what do you think that does for a the traditional movement and b the church at large? I mean, I just think so many people like. Okay, so we're coming up on I what I think is like a toss up between the top two stories would be this the, the blessing thing that we just got, but also the Strickland story, right? So Strickland just happened yeah. also. They, I mean, all of these happen at the end, but you think about how many normies woke up from a guy like Strickland or even like a guy like Altman. I mean, Altman. He, Father know, Altman has done a good job of alienating a lot of those people though. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Regardless whether you agree with what he says or not, objectively true. A lot of people have publicly said they don't, they don't, they no longer side with them. Well, I think there's that. That's the line, right? There's um, you saw what happened to Patrick Coffin. Patrick Coffin, mm -hmm. as soon as he said he thinks Francis is an anti pope, he gets cut out of the conversation. Altman, same thing. As soon as he came out and said it, there's something too when you go full blown, I don't think this man is the pope, or I think he's the an anti pope, that you actually kind of get cut out of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, right? that's true. I mean, the, the Pope is the point of unity for Catholics, whether you like the Pope or not. The, the papacy itself is the point of unity for Catholics. Yeah. So it's a it's a it's a rough one. Um, what's the next big story we got, Matt? Uh, I was trying to think of something big that happened over the summer. I mean, one good story uh, from the middle of the year was certainly the discovery of Sister Villamina's. Um, incorrupt body that's a that was a huge positive story for the for the entire church especially here in america mm -hmm. yeah we did a show on that but i couldn't i tried to review some of the stuff that went on over the summer i didn't find anything that really stuck out to me it was much more a busy uh spring with fall. the things i just mentioned and then certainly this fall has been nuts uh with the bishop strickland yeah, yeah. okay that the Dodgers, uh, I do remember the Dodgers protest. Okay, yeah, that's right. That was a big deal. That was something that Bishop's also connection to Bishop Strickland. He went out there when the local bishops, you know, released kind of a milk toast um, statement of some kind. I forget exactly what they said. Well, that's but, where the Strickland drama starts, like where it really starts picking up. He goes to LA and he. I don't know if it started, but that was certainly a high profile example of, mm. of him, yeah, treading the, the, in. The, the biggest point is when he puts out that tweet. Uh, it had to do with Patrick Coffin because he was supposed to be on Patrick Coffin's yep. network doing the Hope for Fuel thing. And right. he had to come out and basically distance himself from Patrick Coffin and E. Michael Jones. So that whole thing got really crazy because Patrick Coffin says that Francis is an anti pope, and E. Michael Jones, with yep. all of his Amish talk, is very. Uh, yeah, he's a I'm, very I'm a little surprised guy. that. Uh, that Bishop Strickland actually agreed to be there if he Michael Jones is there. Well, I don't know if he knew. So, you know, like we all assume 
like people know these people like strickland's a busy guy he probably had no idea who e michael jones was so then he comes out with this tweet that says uh here i'll read i'll read the tweet for yeah you. let's read got, the tweet was, uh, i'd like to actually not misquote it here i want to i'll send it also to in the um the private chat so you guys can take a look if somebody wants to throw it on the screen you can so he said and Patrick Coffin, I think he was organizing some kind of online conference, Hope is Fuel, if I remember yeah. the name correctly. So Strickland was originally had originally said he would speak, but then after he found out about uh, Coffin's position on Francis, decided to, to drop out of it. He said, please allow me to clarify regarding, quote, Patrick Coffin has challenged the authenticity of Pope Francis. If this is accurate, I disagree. I believe Pope Francis is the Pope, but it is time for me to say that I reject his program of undermining the deposit of faith. Follow Jesus. That's the tweet. Now they went crazy over that, right? Yep. And you saw mm -hmm. all the people that's where, see, I think that that, that, that was like a, a watershed moment for a lot of people because you had, that's when you start getting lost. I think that's the people. only diocesan bishop in the world who has ever put it so bluntly. I don't mm -hmm. I don't see anything as clear and clear cut as, and forceful as that. Yeah. Now, what is the synod on synodality, if not a program to undermine the faith? Right. I mean, yeah. And I guess if thinking about stuff from earlier in the fall, Bishop Strickland put out that series of excellent pastoral letters to the Diocese of Tyler, which is really applicable to anybody about the synod on synodality. And it's uh, he went through I forget he had a list of like seven or eight bullet point items that he was that he discussed in detail throughout the series of letters one of which was of course the same sex blessing stuff which we've now seen come to pass um and just other stuff related to the synod on, that they were discussing like female deacons which i think will probably still be seen and then perhaps in the near future it'll be interesting to see how much longer francis is around i mean maybe we'll make some predictions toward the end of the show but on it i don't know I don't know if I want to go on record as saying this or not, but I think we're getting towards the end of the Francis pontificate. I mean, he's getting, he's like 86, 87 years old now. I don't think he's in the best of health. He's slowed down a lot, uh, probably over the past year to 18 months or so. Um, I would be surprised if he makes it to the end of 2024, personally. I think he's going to be around for longer than the people expect. Actually. You think so? Yeah, <laughs> always the optimist, Dan. <laughs> I don't know. I don't I, know if, I, if it's me not being optimistic about that. <laughs> I think I'd rather have Francis than, than Fernandez. I think the devil, you know, man. <laughs> right. The devil, yeah. you know, and it's. I think that Francis will make it around to see the synod close in twenty four. You think so? Yeah, I think he'll. I think he'll be around to see the close of the synod in twenty four, and, and his own document that he wants to have issued afterwards. In, in late 2024, early 2025. I think he'll be around until the end of that. And I think I think we're going to see something from heaven after that happens. I just I think we're gonna have to, yeah. I, you're gonna your watch for consistory to be announced, by the way. Watch for what? A consistory, another one. He's had more consistories than almost any other pope in the in the same time span. Yeah, he's he gonna have to change later here. He's going to have to change the rules because there's more more cardinals than are actually allowed to vote according to the rules in by Pope. John yeah, Pope. Like, yeah, but that's that, that that's not the rule change that everybody is hearing about now. There was a big story. Think, there was a big story think, that broke that they were going to uh, allow uh, allow, allow, allow a laity to vote in the yeah. turn of the conclave synodal, and right. the cardinal in charge of the the writing of the drafting of the new rules to the conclave came out and said, "No, no, no, no that's not happening." And then immediately the next day had a face-to-face -face meeting with Francis behind closed doors. I'm pretty sure that's happening, actually. I would be surprised at this point if it didn't happen. It, it would be their trump card. 25% of the participants, meaning in this case, you'd be putting 40 people in, who are handpicked by yeah. Cardinal Grish and Cardinal Hollerick. I mean... <sighs> Yeah, <laughs> it's too yeah, perfect. You certainly got the deck stacked against anybody who's there's got press, There's almost precedent for this kind of stuff, too. I mean, they could point out to well, we chose Roman laity and, you know, for the first whatever centuries, you know, we're the laity who voted for the Pope, for the Roman pontiff. Mm, we're just yeah. going back to the ancient church. Yeah, antiquarianism, right? It's not actual yeah. tradition. There, It's antiquarianism where they try to yank these things as the church is actually developing its mm -hmm. rubrics and developing its systems 
go back and just pluck right. something from out of there and go, look, it's traditional. We're doing what the it's so contradictory. Is. They took they constantly talk about the development of doctrine, the development of the church, and yet they also are antiquarians. It's so yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. Do you do I you mean, think the idea to let laity vote shows that they believe that they're losing the cardinals? That they don't like the outcome. You know, I mean, look, it's a political process. Daniels admitted that that they were lobbying, but breaking the rules that John Paul II set down. If they're willing to, if that's, if that is what they're willing to admit publicly, then that means that they look at it as a political process. And this is why I just, I react so negatively when someone says the Holy ghost chooses the Pope. I'm like, not. not really, but <laughs> that is a, one of those Vatican twoisms that you can't really find much reference to from before the council. Yes. Right. Cardinals can open themselves in prayer to the guidance of the Holy spirit at the conclave. Do we have um, any reason to believe that that's been the way things have been done for the last several decades? I don't see a single reason to believe that. Yeah. And God doesn't, would not actively give us her, you know, did God give us Benedict the 10th? The famous. Yeah, no, there's not even a case of it. The church doesn't I mean, even claim on. that. Yeah. The <laughs> church doesn't claim that. It's a, it's a preposterous. I remember body. John Venari years ago published in the paper, a great quote from a saint. I can't recall it now, but it was something to that effect. Like, you know, you just because, essentially that God does not override the free will of the cardinal electors and that they can, they can either make a very good decision or they can make a very bad decision. And we need to pray for them that they make a good decision. It's never been the yeah. teaching of the church that God directly chooses the Pope. I mean, that's no, just that's, nonsense. That sounds the like, that sounds like, democracy? it sounds like Roman Calvinism basically. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Predestination and stuff yeah. like that. Like it's, it's preposterous. You think about some of the, we've had some horrible popes throughout the years and there's no way the Holy Ghost. Now what God will do is uh, through our, he'll bring good from our bad. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, right. I mean, you, you look, go, go right back to the crucifixion from God can write straight with crooked lines, we would say. So, I mean, one of the main benefits of even a, Fran a Francis pontificate is the four of us having this conversation. Like we would not even know each other if, you had a Benedict the Seventeenth in or something. Somebody's asking in the chat if the Holy Ghost chooses Catholic social media influencers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, obviously. <laughs> Somebody else asked earlier if I object when someone calls me Mister instead of Doctor. I actually hate being called Doctor. The dumbest people I've ever met in my life have been people with PhDs. Yeah. There's like a it's a it's an almost perfect correlation. <laughs> I, no. I had made a comment on uh, on social media today saying that um, going to a, a, a same sex wedding is equivalent to going to a black mass. Now, I'm not saying it's the same in degree, but you're taking a sacrament and you're mocking it. it. You're and, doing it and diabolically you're... inverting it. Exactly. A black, a black mass is apparently said in reverse, mm -hmm. but the, and the consecration is still valid. Well, if it's, it's a priest why you see doing some... it. Right. Yeah. Because, well, Black masses apparently are always said by by an actual fallen priest. Okay, so yeah, but it, my point was just that. Yes, I've seen some of the interviews with some of the uh, from the, some of the reformed Satanists. <laughs> so, the yes. uh, but some, some like people were, were getting on me like I can't believe you're a supposed Catholic influencer and all this. I'm like, first off, don't nobody should ever be influenced by me. But I was making the point <laughs> that if you're going to a same sex wedding, you, you're actually it's. It's a difference in degree, but not kind. You're going to a subversion of a sacrament and you're participating in it. And there's, it should be seen as on the same, I, mean, I don't know. I don't know if I'd say the same level. There's a black mass. You're actually desecrating God himself. But I mean, the, the sacrament of marriage is a reflection of the Trinity. So I do think there's definitely a, a comparison there, you know, like there's definitely a way to analogous situation in that. Well, uh, yeah, you're going to a to a celebration that's honoring a sin that cries to heaven for vengeance. I mean, it's yeah, not something you want to be doing. Yeah. yeah. Um. Okay. So then we get to the synod, right? Because that's like the the fall story. We get to the synod. Now, the yes. story coming out of the synod is that, oh, look, all the things you thought were going to be in the synod aren't in the synod. It's really not that bad. You don't get all these same sex things and all that stuff, and then you get the dubia answered right at the beginning mm -hmm. of the synod and then a month after the close of it you get or two months after you get this yeah thing that we're talking yeah. about while the synod has said they're going to be taking this topic up at the next at the final phase of the synod right 
And do not be surprised if we get like a James Martin Synod announced. Because it, what always happens after a synod is closed, within weeks, they announce what the next one is. Yeah. Because we're in a state of permanent adjournamento, a permanent revolution mm. in the church. Yeah. That's what, they, honestly, if we ever get a truly based and red-pilled pope, super trad pope, I'd like him to put an end to the synodal stuff. Just all of it. No more. All of it. Right. Because 2020, October 2024 is actually not the end of this process. They have in mind permanent, as as Anthony just said, permanent synodality to the point I was going to try and pull up a document. I just thought of the final document um, from the Synod on Synodality talks about this. Let me see if I can find it real quick. They Like one of the, um, I mean, it's just a list of recommendations or suggestions basically let me see if I can find, but it talks about having like an ecumenical worldwide synod, not just ecumenical in the sense of other, not in the sense of a, like a Catholic church council, but having a, like an interdenominational in that sense, ecumenical, essentially council uh, in 2025 in honor of the anniversary of the council of Nicaea. That's how nuts these people are. Yeah. So they're talking about having East and West uh, reunified. But also involving the Protestants, involving everybody. Oh, nothing's it's crazy going to come from this, and and you know, especially with the leadership we have, and now that it's just going to be concession after concession to the point where they're going to be conceding like issues of doctrine. I would imagine, in order for the East right. to be willing to unify with us, like we have doctrinal differences there. It's not just uh, on on papal supremacy. You know, there's right. more than that. There is more than that, okay? Aside from, look, it's an unpopular thing to say, but the Easter heretics, they deny yeah. Marian dogmas. Mm -hmm. They deny the primacy of the Roman pontiff. It's unpopular to say that because deep down inside, even most traditional Catholics are ecumenical. Mm -hmm. But there's a bigger stumbling block than that too. Eastern theologians have said unequivocally that the Novus Ordo Misse is a gigantic stumbling block to any reunification effort, efforts. As it should frankly, be. it's only Catholics who talk about reunification with the East. The East yeah. really talk about it. Well, I, if they talk about it. They don't want it. Yeah, there's no incentive. What's the incentive? So they can then bring in modernism and deaconettes and things into their, into their churches? You know, girls at the altar? Yeah, the biggest sell for Eastern Orthodoxy right now is that they didn't have a council. And that they're kind of stuck in time back before all these radical changes came. So it's appealing to people to want to go back to, I mean, their liturgy wasn't touched. They do have uh, some crazy things in there, but like even with having, allowing, like all the things that people complain about in the Catholic church, especially when it comes to like divorce and remarriage and stuff, they're doing in the Eastern churches. It's just done differently, you know? Hmm. So, um, yeah, so I, I, to me, I think the answer to the dubia was probably the biggest story up until, all right, so I would say Strickland, the answering the dubia, and then this recent, so I say those are the top three stories. Do you guys agree with that, or you think there was something else in there that I'm missing? Um, There's something else. Go ahead. The uh, Cardinal Betchew story out of the Vatican. Decade upon oh, decade upon is. decade of financial corruption in the Vatican is being laid at the feet of a of a cardinal who is basically doing just doing what he was told. If you go through over the the Vatican financial scandals over the decades, I mean, you just go back the last ten years. Before Becciu, it was Cardinal Pell was the one investigating this stuff. And before Cardinal Pell, it was Archbishop Vigano. You begin to see how this works. The difference is they replaced Pell with somebody who was on their team, which is why. Yeah. Bet you still has his luxurious apartment in Rome and has not been told he has to start paying rent the way Cardinal Burke has been told. And why I'm very skeptical that he's ever going to sit in a jail cell. Yeah, yeah he just got sentenced. He, but Francis will be like, and great act of mercy and accompaniment and inclusion. We're going to give this. Well, yeah, he was, wasn't he just sentenced to like five and a half five, years in five jail? Five years, or something? Yeah. yeah. But even Benedict pardoned his secretary that released all of the the um, right, right. Like even Benedict well, did that. Plus, Rupnik was swept under the rug. So if he's going to get swept under the rug for the things he did to nuns and the grotesque sacrileges he committed at the altar, then there's then why would bet you not get, <laughs> be absolved? 
Yeah, the Rubnik story. What's crazy is we're talking about like th like things that you know are on our radar. We tried to really not talk about the Rubnik thing just because I was so grossed out. Even the I couldn't that. talk about all the stuff about the Rubnik story. You could you could honestly lose a YouTube channel for some of the stuff that that guy was doing. The things he was, yeah, was all I'm going to say is the stuff he involved you did involving chalices, satanic. It's yeah, it's talk about this is somebody who should. Stuff. This is why we need a, an actual inquisition, a holy inquisition. Not to go after, you know, the way people think of the Inquisition being used, but to go after priests like Rubnik. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're arguing about artwork. Like, it's not, <laughs> yeah. Because right. artwork is satanic. It is. It is. But that's one aspect I, of the story. There's right. many aspects of the story that are so diabolic, so evil, that most people have no idea. So, uh, who is going to save our church? Not our bishops, not our priests and religious. It's up to you, the people. You have the minds, the eyes, the ears to save the church. What do you think of that quote? It's part of my little bit of evidence that I suspect that uh, Fulton Sheen had buyer's remorse after Vatican II towards the end of his life. <laughs> that uh, he would always been kind of a progressive starting at least in the 50s. Like he said, Matt, he said the traditional mass sometimes in the vernacular in public. Yeah. Did a few other things, and he always joked about being a progressive. The same guy who wrote some of the most scathing critiques of communism was also yeah, but progressive back then in the fifties doesn't didn't mean what progressive means now, right? It's uh, I mean it's still the same mentality and it's still the same ideology, but like if even some of the guys, but like I think even Benedict before the council had you know when they had the communio versus the uh, whatever the other thing was, like Benedict had yeah. some yeah the concilium versus the communio. So, like, That's even what, Benedict wanted to back off of some of the things he was pushing for. And well, he, he, tried to, well, he had buyer, he clearly had buyer's remorse. I mean, yeah, you don't develop the hermeneutic of continuity if you don't have buyer's remorse for the things that have been happening. I'm, I'm one of those who's skeptical of the hermeneutic of continuity simply because I can't find continuity in contradictory statements. The church yeah. condemning religious liberty and then endorsing religious liberty to the point of telling Catholic countries to disaffiliate themselves with the church formally. You can't have yeah. continuity with that. So what what do you think the like what what do you do you think the only way this gets resolved is if a holy pope says I mean do we have to go back and and address everything since the council basically? No, no, no. Francis is the key. Ironically. If you have questions about the the canonizations, if you have questions about a lot of things, the very first thing that could be done is a pope under his authority declaring Francis an anti-pope. Yeah. I don't have the authority to do that, but a pope does. And then he can go from there and just if he, if he wanted to be a wrecking ball against modernism, that's that's where you the easy entry point. Because if you say I remember the day the Paul the 6th canonization was announced, watching Michael Matt like barely able to contain the laughter while recording like a, just a, one of his his scathing critiques of this stuff. That's your entry point. But how do you get that holy pope? Yeah. Well, we were and saying like the, I think I think a holy pope comes probably on the back of mushroom clouds at this point. There's your rosy Christmas season prediction. Our, well, our no, idiot had, rulers, we, our idiot you're rulers not the first person to say war. it. Our idiot rulers won a nuclear war. You're not the first no. person to say it. Like Michael Hitchborn kind of uh, uh, has that view also. It's like, look, we still haven't seen Adama. We still haven't seen the city in ruins. Right? right, so you 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 like you you if you start seeing things through that lens without getting into apocalyptomania and things like mm -hmm. that, it's look we're talking about a pope who had idol worship in the Vatican. We're talking about a pope who's messing around with, you know, what I just described as equivalent to going to a black mass, and he's trying to work this stuff into the church in some way, even though he's clearly defined that it's not whatever. Like it's not marriage and things like that. It doesn't matter. He's still flirting with that language, flirting with those ideas, and trying to incorporate it into our ritual. So your your the idea that we're not going to have some kind of divine chastisement, I think, is naive, right? Otherwise, mm -hmm. God, like, what kind of God do we have if He just doesn't intervene? Remember when people say, hey, "How can you believe that they would rig a conclave?" I'm like, "Well, how can you believe?" that the the man that is accepted by the world as pope which is one of the key marks of a valid papacy by the way would permit idol worship in yeah. the vatican on multiple occasions because over the course of several days there were several pacamama events at in saint peter's yeah and one of them yeah. being on an altar yeah this was this is 
it's just a continuation of the original CC stuff. People don't like hearing yeah. about a CC, but you got to bring it up to people. You know, mm -hmm. the world watched as a tabernacle was doors were opened, the Eucharist were moved by a priest, and a Buddha placed on top of a tabernacle in a Catholic church, in a CC, with John Paul II in the room when it happened. Yeah. Now, what happened to that church? Oh, uh, wasn't a few months later an earthquake happened and the whole thing fell down or something? Yeah. Yeah. So you don't think that that's you don't think that that's kind of like a, a a foreshadowing of what we're going to see on a larger scale? I do. I, I see that as a foreshadowing event. Look what look what happened with that altar in Assisi. I think that's a foreshadowing event of what I mean. Look, you go back and you read the Old Testament. You look at what God does to the Israelites every single time they play around with idol worship. Like that is the one thing that he just has no patience for at all. Mm -hmm. Now you got to realize yeah. when they're telling, when you're reading the, 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 the biblical stories, they, they almost seem like a, an exact succession of events, but that's not really what happens. Like there's years in between when God, the chastisement comes. So you're living through something like that now, where when you tell the story of what happened 50 years from now of what happened, you're going to explain the story as if the Pachamama happened, then you had a plague hit, then, and you're just going to mention the highlights. So it will seem like this quick succession of events that took place, but there's years that stretch out in between those events mm -hmm. that when you tell mm -hmm. the story later on, it just seems like it's like one event after another. Happened. The only time the, I, the only things that I can tell in the old Testament are linear are the beginning of Genesis and then book ending with Maccabees. Yeah. Right, because Maccabees is Roman stuff, so everything else I'm I'm really foggy on the timeline with the rest of the, but that's not the point. The point of reading those things is not necessarily know the timeline, unless you have a special well, interest. In it. Yeah, I mean it's good to know like the the high the timeline mm -hmm. of salvation history. But yeah, all I'm saying is when you you know for people who because I I remember uh, growing up in the '90s having like a bit of apocalyptic mania. There was especially uh, you know. As the year 2000 was approaching, everybody thought Y2K was coming. Uh, mm -hmm. You had the Medjugorje apparitions were, you know, happening and you had statues bleeding and all these things. And people really did have this sense that the world was going to end in 2000. I remember it because I remember on New Year's Eve 1999 going into 2000 at midnight. I went in my friend's basement and I turned the power off in the whole house. I scared the heck out of the entire house. <laughs> <laughs> like, nice. everybody think, yeah. made everybody think the power went out. So. <laughs> You're the worst. Oh, yeah. It was hilarious. Areas that everybody <laughs> died. Um, but I remember that everybody thinking like it's the year 2000, something's going to happen. And I think no, the world ended on September 11th, 2001. The world as it existed ended that day. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Anthony was selling flags. Yes. <laughs> I, I went to a flag store and bought every American flag I could, and I was selling them. I was laid off of work. What was I going to do? I had to make some money. I, yeah. I got two reactions. So I was selling flags on the side of the road after 9 11. Some people were super grateful because they wanted a flag and they couldn't get one. And then other people would spit at us as they were passing by. Because what, we what was the markup? Oh, it was a <laughs> lot, dude. <laughs> we were buying the flags like $3 each and selling them for 20 Like we made oh. thousands of dollars. Yeah. <laughs> that was 18 Forgive me, Lord. I don't know what to tell you guys. But yeah, that, so you had this, you know, coming up on 2000, you had that, you know, this fear that everything was going to happen now things didn't happen right away. And I think people kind of got sick of waiting on the end of the world to come. And I think people have just kind of, uh, I, I remember, I remember talking to somebody who said, yeah, I used to think the end of the world was coming any day. I was always waiting for the next thing to happen. And it just never comes and nothing ever actually winds up happening. This, is why, I, this is why I rarely do my prophecy videos anymore. Yeah. Although I've got one coming this week, actually. But, but yeah, a lot of it feels like that. just like, OK, but, you know, when do these things ever happen? When do they actually finally come true? But I think part of the stretching out and not letting them happen is so that you do become complacent and think, OK, maybe this isn't going to happen. And then it hits you when you least expect it. I think one prophecy that all of us should be aware of and the, the guests as well, you know, the year 2029, because mm -hmm. Our Lady, yeah. uh, Our Lady of Fatima. You know, she originally appeared in 1917. She said she would return to ask for the consecration of Russia, which she did on June 13th, 1929. Uh, so that was what 12 years after the second, her second apparition at Fatima. And she said, you know, I'm paraphrasing, the moment has come in which the Holy Father, or excuse me, in which God asks the Holy Father uh, to consecrate and Russia to her Immaculate Heart, and with Him all the bishops of the world really to order them to do that with him. Um, I think it's 
I don't know. I think it's pretty clear at this point. Um, you guys can well, disagree there's a relation if you want, but that... from, there's a relation from that and the King Louis was asked to right. great France, right? So you have this yeah. hundred year period where King our Louis Lord, was... Yeah, yeah, and our Lord himself is the one who made this analogy when he spoke to Sister Lucia, I think it was in 1931, when she was in a convent in Riano, Spain. He said something like, you know, um, make known to my ministers that if they delay the execution of my command, namely the consecration of Russia, they will suffer the same fate. Uh, I'm paraphrasing again, suffer the same fate as King Louis, uh, I think it was King Louis the 14th, who was is originally issued the order to consecrate France to the sacred heart of Jesus and put the, the emblem of the sacred heart on the French flag. Uh, and that would have does from a prison cell. I think, like, well, yeah, one, I think it was his grandson. It was Leo or excuse me, uh, Louis the 16th who 16th, did it from a jail yeah, cell. Yeah. But it was too late at that point. So like a, a hundred years to the day from 1689 to 1789. Um, so our Lord made that that parallel, that analogy in relation to Fatima, that if this is not done exactly as I have commanded, which one of the stipulations is that all the bishops of the world must participate. That's not an, an optional thing. That's that's of the essence of the act is that it has to be a collegial act. Yeah. And I just don't think there's enough evidence to say that uh, what Francis did on March 25th, 2022 meets the criteria for that. Oh, no, so that was I last year. That so we talked about that into 2022 year review. Okay, that's yeah, right. yeah. So that here's so here's something uh, interesting. I was putting together a video uh, about what Malachi Martin said about Vatican II, and which is going to have to become multiple videos because it's 13 pages of notes. Thanks with put together with the help of a listener who did a lot of that work actually. But um, he he having always claimed to have read the Third Secret said that the consecration is for Russia and only Russia. Yeah, and he which is what a lot of us have and... said. It's just like you know, you're asked to consecrate Russia, not Russia, then whoever else. Just do Russia. It shouldn't right. take long. It shouldn't even be that. It doesn't have to be an extravagant thing. Just so your take on Malachi Martin. Uh, you're you're you've come around on him, right, Aunt? I've been I've, I've been pro Malachi Martin the whole time. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's got some interesting stuff, man. It's like he he. I think I he's. A, I think the only thing that the only critique I could ever give him negatively is that he was a bit of a showman, which yeah. is sort of a, you know, he had the storyteller flaw of liking to, you know, you'd only ever see it when talk. You'd only see it when he was on Art Bell. If you ever, that's yeah. why I always tell people if you like Malachi Martin, we heard there, go watch the, or listen to the Bernard Jansen interviews. They're superior mm -hmm. every single way, and they're much more grounded, and they're much more scary than the stuff he's talked about with Art Bell. Yeah. And there's like 10 yeah. hours of them on YouTube. Although I suggest people go buy them from Bernard Jansen directly, but there's 10 hours of them or something. And the transcripts are also available for purchase from him as well. Yeah. I've got, a, the, I've got a copy of them. What are the biggest things against him though? Wasn't it, uh, weren't there accusations that he like had a girlfriend or something? After he yeah. Was they're sick? all false. They all came out they're right after false. he wrote a book about the Jesuits. And, uh, um, there's somebody that, that I interviewed knew him in life and is writing a book. And bringing the receipts to exonerate him on that. Is that the guy you interviewed? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. What What's the most pushback on anything you've ever done? It like what 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 like we when we mentioned Altman, we got a ton of pushback. People, I got I got him. I got some a little bit of pushback for hinting that I didn't think Altman's uh, tone was helpful. And I'm not a tone police guy, but there are limits. And saying you know taking the uh, millstones and uh, analogy that our Lord used and turning it into an instruction. Yeah. That's a bit much. Um, yeah. I mean, if I go a long time without calling him Pack a Papa and then I use it again, some I get pushback. People who found my channel they go, <laughs> How can you call him that? I'm like, well, yeah. Are you watching? <laughs> <laughs> well, the Altman thing, I said that was my same criticism because I saw him at a, uh, I was at the Cancel Priest Conference and I saw him speak live there. And my issue wasn't with, what he was saying necessarily it was that he was whipping a crowd into a frenzy over these things and mentioning specific things about specific people and i was just like it seemed dangerous to do that to whip a crowd into a frenzy saying the words god like it almost sounded like he was taking the lord's name in vain saying he damns you you know and it was it's like it was borderline it was very borderline yeah like i had a really hard time with that now look i mean 
that's on his conscience and he has to answer for that. I just, I had just mentioned that I felt a little uneasy with it and man, our comments were lit up with pro Altman people. Just he's a saint. And I'm like, all right, settle down. Honestly, oh you know what the biggest thing I get pushed back these days for is I dare to suggest there's a distinction between a set of being a set of a contest and a, well, what they call themselves now interregnumists. Yeah. But I think there is a difference. There is a difference with well, the day that Patrick Coffin or, um, who is another one? Uh, Edward, Doctor Edward Mazza comes out and says, "There has not been a valid pope since 1958." That's yeah. the day I'll be okay calling them set of a contest. Now, there is a variation of set of a contestism out there that is, there are two variations that are even like weirder than normal set of a contestism is, which is there's a variation out there that claims there hasn't been a valid pope since Pius the Ninth died <laughs> because of the loss of the papal states. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've encountered them. Um, my favorite, though, is the one that says that every pope since I think Innocent the Third was an yeah. was heretic an anti yeah. or something. Yeah, there are more of those out there than you might think. Like that's that that is loony. Well, it's kind it. of the Eastern Orthodox position, isn't it? <laughs> Eastern <laughs> Orthodox thinks it's about yeah, well, 60, 60 years difference. But <laughs> when someone says like somebody loses their credibility when they say Thomas Aquinas was a heretic. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> then what is well, speaking of that speaking of that whole issue, and that's another significant story from the towards the end of the year is Archbishop Vigano coming out and um basically saying that Francis, you know, I forget exactly what he said in the, the talk that was supposed to be played at the Catholic Identity Conference, but uh didn't end up getting played. I was there. Um, but basically that there's a defect in um and Bergoglio's consent because he didn't consent to the papacy as the papacy is in in and of itself, something to that effect. It would almost be like a marriage annulment, right? So if his intent is to undermine the office when he gets sworn in, that's essentially uh, yeah. It's, no, it's like a, no, uh, it's it would be like a person going to get married, never intending to keep their vows from the day they get married. Yeah, that so would be an interest. That'd be an interesting out for a future pope to decide on. Now, here's the other part of that, though. There's a, a that most people didn't pick up on. I I think I recorded for my channel the um his address to Edward Ma Dr. Maza's conference. Yeah, that's more said, recent. Yeah, yeah, where he said that Francis is Pope. That it, right. That until future ch the church in the future decides as such, none of us have the authority to declare him an anti-pope. Correct. And they told that to their faces there. Who said that? Oh, Vigano said that. Vigano yes. said that. Yeah. He said specifically, I do not have the, none of us have the official authority to declare Francis an anti-pope. We, we can recognize him as a false prophet, quoting from our Lord's words in Matthew 7, 15, which I certainly agree with. But I also agree with Vigano that we don't have the authority to definitively say Francis is an anti-pope. None of us as yeah. private individuals have that authority. I, yeah, that's the position I hold. Right, so that's the, mine too. Like I, I, all, the, As far as I'm willing to go is... I would be surprised if he wasn't declared as such in the future. Yeah, me but and Rob had that, that conversation. Like, like the more things that happened this year, Rob was like, "So, what do you think? Like, the chances have flipped to right? You know, like, like, it's like what percentage it like, is it now? Yeah, it's like thirty like percent <laughs> chance he'd be declared that. And I think we're like we're in like the 70, 80 percent. What is that? A, what is that? But I think we're. What Are you guys talking about the percentage of like people or Catholics around the world who <laughs> no, currently like, recognize no, him? Like, personally, he's betting odds basically at this point. What is the likelihood a future pope will? Oh, I see. He's an anti pope. So, like early on, it was like, eh, like 30%. Now it's like a 75, 80. It's like, come on. Some of this stuff is just so bonkers. It's like the yeah. funniest question you can hit people with is, is Francis Catholic? <laughs> because <laughs> it, like, it, and what does that mean? Is he Catholic? He's baptized and he claims to be Catholic and he's inside the church. So, but does he believe the Catholic faith? So it's a funny one to ask people because if they, it's a hard question to answer. They have to define what they mean by Catholic first well, every time. One, and then if they say no, it's like, what well, can a non-Catholic be Pope? You know, so it's one of those things where, you know, people are starting to call me a, a I think somebody called me a crypto set. Crypto set. They called me a crypto set. A, like, a full throated crypto set. How can you be yeah, a crypto set, was... but yet very loud about it? And it's like, <laughs> I understand why people are saying that, but I, I'm just, I don't know. I is that kind of like how point. America is crypto Catholic, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So I just right, I so. want to point out that the another big story, I mean, the obvious one is church militant. If you'd had to place your bets, 
five years ago, which organization was going to last national Catholic register or national Catholic uh, reporter or church militant. Would you have taken the bet that the reporter would have outlasted church militant? Yeah. Yeah. I would have, because um, I'll tell you why without getting too deep into church militant stuff, I just saw Mm -hmm. the way they treated other Catholics. And I always had a problem with that. Like I was a church militant supporter at one point. I Mm -hmm. was, I was a supporter of theirs. I subscribed to their content, paid $10 a month for it. And Mm -hmm. it just got to a point where I was just like, does this guy think he wants to go it alone? Like, why is he trying to go it alone? I saw him attacking. um, Like I had a running list of every Catholic public Catholic that Michael Boris went after. And it was a long, like you're talking about the Drew Mariani and Patrick Madrid. And did 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 you include the people they went after on Twitter? Yeah, so I I think I missed a few and because I, and uh, I, because uh, uh, somebody was it you Matt who sent me something like Christine Niles had tweeted about me that nobody noticed like it got no interactions or something. I mean, she's coming after me. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't remember who did it, but it was somebody. Somebody did that. It was because I got sent an anonymous email asking me why I don't like church militant, and. Yeah. and I ignored the voice of the guardian angel on my shoulder telling me not to answer that email. And then like an hour later, a screen cap of it was on, was on Twitter. I, think I found I out about it 10 something. days later. It was probably Jules Gomez. It was 10 days later. No, it was, it was, it wasn't a, it wasn't a, it wasn't a, it was a, it, was a, it, it wasn't a name that I would recognize. So Jules Gomez a while back had messaged our, a, per, a friend of mine who had an anonymous Twitter handle. Uh, but he has a podcast too, and he said his name on the podcast. But he had an anonymous Twitter handle, and Jules mm-hmm. Gomez reached out to him and said, "We're trying to do a story on traditional Catholics who hide behind anonymous accounts." And like, started asking him all these questions, and he just ignored it, you know. And I was like, "Oh boy, this is the story they're going to run with here, I guess." Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I just, I, I, I look, I, I saw when I saw the falling out between the remnant. And church militant. That was when I first started saying, "Okay, I don't, I don't want anything to do with this." Like, why are you going here? Deal with this stuff in private. Don't do this stuff publicly. And then the Mike Parrott stuff was just so gross. Like that whole ordeal. And I, Matt, I've seen you. I've seen them publicly go after you. I've seen them publicly go after Anthony. Right. Seen, like, there's nobody that I haven't seen them go after. And it was just like, what, what is, what is this? Why, why are they doing this? I don't understand. And it's more than just the the complete collapse of church militant. I mean, as I understand it now, there are possible criminal charges coming yeah. against Michael Voris, possibly yeah. Christine Niles, uh, Simka what? Fisher's husband. I forget his name, but he's been Amy. doing a lot of re- Amy, yeah, Damien. That's Amy it. He's Fisher been doing a lot of reporting. Lot of reporting. Is Simka Fisher Catholic? Uh, I think she claims. Paper? To- <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. I she's see, like I aware. That, I didn't even know that Simca Fisher was a female. So for some reason, every time I read their writing, I thought it was a guy. Uh, My okay. apologies for that. For that. For, for that. <laughs> hey, Anthony. In the when we were in the green room, Anthony said that uh, Catholics don't tend to um, super chat. Mm-hmm. Look at that, Ant. <laughs> Have any of you seen I, the video from Father Chazel, an SSPX uh, MC priest, where he claims that Archbishop Vigano is working with the Society Resistance and has been conditionally consecrated? I didn't see I, that story. I have heard that. I know somebody who talks to Bishop Williamson on a regular basis. I asked them, and they said their response was, don't believe everything you hear on the internet. Yeah. So, Rob, you had a question highlighted from Paul, right? Uh, Yeah, well, we have a couple, but here's, yeah, here's one from Paul. Um, do you know of any link between like the Epstein's of the world and Vatican hires up like Colonel Bish- uh, Becu or That's any true. any others? I think Archbishop Vigano addressed some of that in his mm-hmm. um, speech that he gave at this recent online conference, didn't he, Anthony? I think if I remember, I that think correctly. so. I I would if you're looking for a link, I would go. That first link would be McCarrick. That's the obvious point, point, uh, point, but no one has investigated that. And I don't know how you would at this point. Now, in theory, what in a couple of days we're supposed to get the the flight log or something, the the client list, which if you believe that client list when it comes out, come on. Anybody want to take a bet right now? Donald Trump's name appears on that list, as do a bunch of people who are just inconvenient for the Democratic Party. Come on. I mean, it, it, not only that, but you'll, you'll, oh, I have my, Let's see when it comes out. I'll make comments when it comes out. The look at that. Look at you guys. See, 
It's kind of like when the first person does it, then everybody else jumps on board. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the Christmas gifts. Um, the 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 weird thing about the McCarrick stuff was all of the people that got elevated who were so close to him right after. It was almost like they were being elevated to higher positions to keep their mouth shut and give mm -hmm. us the line that you heard World give, where it was, I was utterly shocked. And we're not going to go down that rabbit hole. And all those comments we mentioned earlier, these are the guys that were surrounding McCarrick that mm -hmm. got promoted for the culture of silence that goes on in, in the hierarchy. So what do you guys think the chances are of a Cardinal Supich becoming Pope? Yeah, he's American, so probably not. Yeah, my, my, my thinking, I'm a low chance because he's North American. But man, <laughs> I just think the possibilities. <laughs> I think our channel would be like Rush Limbaugh in the Clinton era. Like we would blow up, <laughs> make it bank. We would, we would explode. And somebody said, like I made that comment. So it was, like, you still don't want it, right? It's like, no, of course I don't want it. I'm just recognizing the reality that our, all of like the people in this content space. Please don't say that. Anthony. <laughs> like all the people in this space are, we all exist because of we are that foil to the chaos in the church right now like we're the only ones pushing back on it it stinks because it should be coming from like aunt you were saying to me in the green room you're like uh what was it uh, they were priests saying not to listen to to online commentators right mm -hmm. yeah they've been saying that because of the blessings document saying that you know don't listen to the people criticizing the pope well okay except most of the people doing the criticizing are literally just regurgitating what the good bishops and good priests who have come out and said these things are we're not giving you mostly our own interpretation we're just saying well cardinal Mueller said this right bishop get, whatever his name is from africa that's blowing uh, up the internet right now yeah i guess don't listen to any african bishop then <laughs> right hmm. well i want them to say it that bluntly because it sounds awful when you actually say it that way well there has there has not been an african in the curious since 1975 at this point that was what uh catholic sat tweeted the hmm. other day that there hasn't been an mm. African in the curia in the curia. I don't think that's correct because that Francis Cardinal Francis Arenze was in the curia. He Renze, was yeah. he was under John Paul II in the. Wasn't well, Turks in there too? Yeah, Turks in. That's mm -hmm. definitely that's definitely not to, accurate. Look up that Catholic sat tweet. Though. And even Cardinal Seurat was a member of the curia, mm -hmm. um, very Still recently. Is I think as part yeah. of the the CCW, right? Yeah. CDW. CDW. Yeah. 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 Well, all right, so let's let's do predictions now. Okay, so Anthony, you said in the in the green room, you said you do not think we'll get another big story before year end. Now, if you had said that on the twenty sixth of twenty twenty two, you'd have missed the Benedict <laughs> passing story. So, but what do you think predictions for twenty four are? The synod on synodality wraps up. A lot of people will claim triumph, and then they'll point fingers at us, saying, "Look, it didn't wasn't that big of a deal." Just because they gave laity formal authority in dioceses and formally gave laity positions in the Roman Curia to help with the development of doctrine, that's not a big deal because you didn't get gay blessings and you didn't get deaconettes and the rest of it. You're going to get that. I still expect a follow up to Traditionis Custodis, but you're watch for watch for consistory news. More cardinals, yeah. More, yeah, and there'll be probably be some names that you'll recognize, who will be uh, who will be now made in the running for, you know, becoming auxiliary bishops and things. My big suspicious suspicion is twenty twenty four will come and go, and that Francis will still be here in January. Okay, any 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 punishments? Like, do you think they'll? You think Francis will uh, censure a Schneider? Like, do you think that he's done putting people out to pasture? Do you think we'll see some big ones? He's done 25 bishops that way and some to some degree or another since 2013, which means he's going to do three or four in 2024. Just by, just by, going. just by the law of numbers, he'll do three or four yeah. of them. Um, what do you think, Ant? 24. I mean, Matt, <laughs> Ant, Matt. Yeah, I think I'd largely agree with what Anthony said. Certainly the Synod on Synodality, uh, it'll be really interesting to see, um, because it's kind of like with the Amazon Synod, the um, there wasn't like immediate major changes, but then we started hearing about like a what was it the Amazon Amazonian right or something, and mm -hmm. the Mayan the Mayan right that stuff started coming out. So we'll have to see 
in the aftermath of the synod on synodality if more um, bombs are dropped. I definitely think there's that Francis, as long as he lives, is still not done trying to stamp out the traditional mass, as Anthony said. And I'm honestly, I'm surprised, you know, early in uh, before the rescript came out that we talked about at the beginning of the show and that came out in February, there was talk about another actual document, like a full blown document coming out with uh, putting the hammer down further. I think that's still a possibility, certainly in 2024, because as Francis has made very clear, and as as others in the Vatican have made very clear, like Cardinal Roach, the traditional Latin Mass is incompatible with the Church's traditional ecclesiology, and that's a that's a major, huge statement to make. That's that's that they're doing our work for us when they say that. Yes, exactly. They are. They exactly. It's exactly right. So they're not going to be satisfied until it's stamped out you know, completely. And people are, and as Francis said in his letter to bishops attached to Traditionis Custodes, he expects, forget the exact quote, but in due time, essentially everyone needs to be going to the Novus Ordo. So they're not going to be satisfied until that's happening to a much larger degree than it is. I think there's been a lot of um, overt and also covert pushback to Traditionis Custodes you know, Bishop Strickland mentions that one of the things that uh, Cardinal Pierre told him was the reason why he got booted is because he didn't implement Traditionis Custodis uh, in the Diocese of Tyler. But I don't, that's certainly not unique to Bishop Strickland. I think there are a lot of dioceses uh, that have been, have not implemented it fully to the letter of the law, certainly as they were in, uh, invoking Canon 87, for example, and other things like that. So I wonder why that um, document didn't come out I, because I do think they had one prepped and ready to go. And I, I don't know, the, like the news leaked that it was going to come out. And then it was all of a sudden, like they tried to make it look like anybody who reported on that was foolish for reporting on rumors. But I do mm-hmm. think they had something prepped and ready to go that just never dropped. And maybe, I mean, the leak could have been what scuttled it. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, maybe they decided like, you know, playing the long term, they thought that it would be more beneficial to make trads look foolish or something by not releasing it when we were thinking that it was coming. Who knows? We've yeah. all, we've all figured out that they like to release things on major Nine feast days feasts. that are close to the heart of traditionalist. I mean, this blessings thing came out on a feast day. That's on like the 1945 calendar, but it's an, it's a feast day. Like it used to be a fairly well, uh, well observed feast day for our lady. Hmm. Um, for anybody who's listening to the audio only, I had that quote wrong about, uh, it, it's this is the first time since 1975 that there is no African in the Curia. Okay, that's, yeah. that's the correct mm. okay. what he actually said. So this is the first that time could since be accurate. 1975. Did that Turk there no make African. Francis upset somehow? And I didn't notice. I think he just reached retirement age and and retired. He he got to set age 75 and and retired from what was it the integral human development office or something. Yeah. Have you <laughs> have you noticed that the people. That, that the bishops that everybody keeps hoping become the next pope, they're all 75 or older, every single one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Other than Schneider, he'd be... <laughs> yeah, but he's, he's not considered Papa Bile because he's an auxiliary. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, right. yeah, I would say 24, you're going to get the uh, creation of a new... Uh, you're going you're gonna to get the creation of a new position for women in the church so yeah. they're going to say we can't ordain women as deacons but we're going to have this new position that for all intents and purposes is a woman deacon but they will call it something else just like the especially with fernandez in there this guy he will word it in a way that mm-hmm. you'll have the pope's planers have plenty of ammunition that they could say everything's orthodox where there's plenty of ambiguity in it for people like us to go this is nonsense how can anybody pull for this and you're just going right. to get more and more of that in 2024 well and i think what people have to remember is that at the average diocesan parish women are already functioning as deacons without being ordained without right. wearing the only, vestments. the only thing they're not doing is reading the gospel Yep. Right. And preaching, but that's not off the table according to the synod on synodality. So I've seen might... women give so called homilies at Novus Ordo. So wow. Yeah. Yeah, of course. They'll they'll have a woman come in from some special thing that has to come in and give it to and it winds up just being the homily, you know. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think you'll see the integration of women being able to read proclaim the gospel, which will be really irking, man. My, my two predictions are 
like you, Anthony, um, I think we, this first session of the Senate gave us gay blessings just in an unexpected way. So I think the next session will give us deaconesses in some form or fashion, even if it comes out as a decree afterwards or something like that. And then I think with next year being the Eucharistic Congress here in the U.S., uh, that yeah. there will be some sort of crackdown kind of against the Eucharist, uh, even within the Novus Ordo, whether it's um, making uh, re reception by hand required or or something of that. Wow, that's a that's a unique that's a unique uh, prediction. I also think Schneider's next on the chopping block. I'm going to say that. That wouldn't surprise me. Um, yeah. I, I do think people need to look on YouTube is a movie called The Catholics. Everybody should watch. Oh that. man, everybody should watch that. <laughs> mm, I haven't heard of that. It's oh, very it's Martin, Martin Martin Sheen in a made in the seventies. He plays a uh, a pretty liberal uh, priest who works for the Roman Curia. It takes place in the grim dark future of the nineteen nineties, yeah. and he's uh, a. <laughs> It's he's just going there to he's going it's there just, to enforce Vatican three, right? Vatican three or three? Vatican four, Vatican wow. three or Vatican four, yeah. And uh, what, what the most recent Vatican Council declared that uh, belief in the real presence was optional. Yeah, wow. And he and he's the and apostolic he, visitor to this religious community who want to be Catholic and are having the traditional mass. Now the movie is does suffer from some of the nineteen seventies nihilism yeah. that. You know where it undermines your heroes and things, but go watch that movie anyway. It's pride. The movie's almost prophetic. The uh, the Holy Father is now called the Father General, and he wears a white turtleneck. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I could see Fernandez wearing a white turtleneck. <laughs> oh man, this Fernandez guy, be, be, guys, I'm telling you, you're gonna get some bombshells from this guy in 2024. Mm -hmm. So, all right, guys, I would love if you look. This is the first time I think we hit 400 live viewers. It's Anthony Anthony Stein is uh, 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 uh giving us a few firsts. Well, so, I, I rarely get far. I rarely get four hundred live viewers. You do it at five a.m. Yeah, not five a.m. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> four a.m. That's late for him, right? <laughs> that's true. <laughs> four a.m. More morning, like midnight. Two a.m. work. I'm, I'm driving into work four a.m. Watching Anthony Stein. Usually, try to throw a comment in while I'm driving, which is always difficult. <laughs> so sometimes <laughs> they come out written wrong because I'm using Siri to send send the comment in. But yeah, and I always enjoy your uh, your morning live cast, man. Keep doing those. I, I plan to keep you like I plan to keep using them because that's the way I broke through YouTube's algorithmic suppression. Yeah, they don't like pre-recorded stuff. Um, Matt, what's going on with you? Uh, are you are you going to be doing any future podcasts? What are you doing lately? Well, I'm, I've been on a little break um, for health reasons from Catholic Family News since late November, but I'm going to be going back to work after New Year's, um, and I'll be focusing more on the, the newspaper side of things, not as much as the on the weekly news roundup. Um, so, I mean, we'll, we'll still have the weekly news roundup, but it'll be uh, Dr. McCall and another McCall. young guy that we've uh, offered that come on at least on a temporary basis to do that with uh, Brian McCall, but I'm hoping to do some, some videos of my own, you know, through Catholic family news, maybe do some interviews and, and we'll see what happens. So we'll have to well, come Matt, back on here you, and talk with you guys again. Yeah. I always love having you on. If there's anything you need us to promote, never hesitate to reach out. And you're like the biggest guy in this business. So I'm not mean, really, you don't need much help. From us. <laughs> um, I, I do have a video recommendation for people. Yeah. For those of you who are into the third secret of Fatima, since we were talking about 2029 and Sister Lucia, um, there's a video you can just look up. Just do a Google, do a search on uh, YouTube for Fatima tip of the spear. And it's the top, the, the, the initial video with 284,000 views and the follow up video with 36,000 views are the top two results. And I suggest people watch those because somebody went through literally everything Sister Lucia sa ever said about the third secret of Fatima. Without it getting into the the real Sister Lucy versus imposter stuff yeah. that people mm -hmm. theorize about, but he she put everything together. He put everything together she ever said about it, and that other notable figure said about it, and he gave what sounds like an interpretation. And he said, "This is not the third secret, but it wouldn't surprise me if this was essentially the nuts and bolts of it." And it's pretty terrifying, actually, what he yeah. describes. So. So, so it's Fatima, the tip of the spear. Yeah, I, I'll I'll put it in our private chat here, a link to it because it's uh, 
I've recommended this before, but I haven't recommended it in a long time. So I'll put it in the uh, StreamYards chat here. There it is right there. Okay, great. It's it's a long video. The guy's channel is mostly just like weird music things and stuff. But this is an hour and 44 minute video. Okay. Yeah. I'm and his follow up. He did a follow up a few months later. So we have to remember that the third secret must be terrifying. The, the text that we have not seen must be terrifying because it took a special grace from Our Lady uh, for Sister Lucia to even be able to write it down. She tried for months to write it down and was physically unable to do so. Um, mm -hmm. And that's documented. Connection. <laughs> that's, that's not likely but okay <laughs> and and that's after she was easily able to write down the vision of hell and how horrified they were at seeing that so it has to be something horrific mm -hmm. yeah because i have a general yeah. like prediction for the rest of the decade and that's somehow or other you get uh the election doesn't go well for the people in power but the next person that they get in 2028 will be much more to their liking and they will you know that's when russia will do its next phase of whatever its conflict is and that's when things go to pot basically okay so do, do you think the process <laughs> of our lady of uh good success about a pope being involved in a two dogmatic pronouncements i never i never actually uh immaculate conception vatican one is legitimate i don't know that prophecy i think that has to do with like the pope of restoration basically and it's probably the co-redemptrix stuff. Co-redemptrix, yeah. Yeah, and whatever the other one is, yeah. Mediatrix of all graces. That one, yeah. 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 I, the number of Catholics I've encountered in life, by the way, you say if the Pope ever declares Our Lady to be co-redemptrix, they're going to leave the church. Wow. It's, it's, it's not shocking. That. Because they don't understand. Like, Popes have already talked about her in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You could actually mm -hmm. do a spreadsheet. You could even make a spreadsheet, a video if you wanted, or an article about... Leo the Thirteenth and the Pious is talking about Our Lady as co redemptrix. Mm -hmm. Explain what it is they say. Yeah, and all it is is if you actually understand. Like I understand it's a confusing term, but when you really understand who Our Lady is, there's nothing wrong at all with that. Right. That if phrase. you want to know what the teaching is, just go read up on Our Lady of Sorrows, and you you, you yeah. get you get what yep. that means. Yep. Man, all right, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. We're not going to do a locals tonight because I'm exhausted, and we're trying to just get back into the rhythm of things here. Um, uh, yeah. Before we go, I want to share. This one fundraiser that was shared with me on Twitter, it's for a the child that was just born, I think, on Christmas Eve and is having some uh, difficulty. So there is a GoFundMe link in the description of this video. I'll throw it in the chat right now, too. Uh, but a, a newborn, basically, that is having troubles with seizures, and they had to baptize him because they were not sure he was going to make it through, I think, yesterday or something like that. So oh, my. Oh, That's so terrible. Yeah, guys, please support that. So, all right. So now on Thursday, we have Father Dave Nix. We're doing um, uh, Rob, you better watch the movie. We're doing we're doing a faith and film series, so where we review a movie that's based on Catholicism. This next episode is going to be uh padre pio miracle man so if you guys can there's a free version of it on youtube mm. it's in italian with english subtitles try to watch it before thursday we're going to watch uh it's padre pio miracle man try to find the italian version with english subtitles and the, we're gonna it is on form too i believe it's on form is that the only one in english oh okay sergio castell castellino i think plays him and it is by far the greatest portrayal of padre pio i've ever seen it is unbelievable it's my favorite Catholic movie other than The Passion. So that's uh, Thursday night. And then uh, in the new year, we got some some good stuff coming up, too. So we will see you guys on Thursday. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Rob, take us out. Mm -hmm.